talking about the quality of health care, this is very, very interesting. Is global warming contributing to preterm and sadly stillbirths? Well, a Wits professor does think so. He's delivered an inaugural lecture this week entitled Climate Change and Maternal Health in Africa. From thermal physiology to public health and advocacy, the research revealing that extreme heat does affect birth outcomes. So very sad, isn't it? Well, let's bring into the conversation uh, the professor that held that lecture, Professor Matthew uh, Chersech, climate change scholar and epidemiologist uh, from Vich University. Prof, good morning to you. Good to have you on ENCA. And I don't think this is a link that many people would have actually made. How did you come about this? Good morning. Good morning. So this, uh, this is a piece of work that WITS has been involved in for many years. What are the impacts of, of heat during, during pregnancy? And I think as global warming sets in, we're more aware of what happens to a woman in, in Pakistan or in, in a place where there's a heat wave and she has no protection from, from heat. Um, and we also know that the fetus is about half a degree warmer than, than the mother is. And so there's been an increasing body of work to examine just what happens to, to the baby. And it does seem quite clear that you do get a um, quite a substantial raised risk in um, a preterm birth as well as stillbirth and a whole range, in fact, of of uh, conditions that affect women and children. Yeah, and it's really sad as well if we focus on uh, areas that are being affected by climate change most. We have to talk about Africa, don't we, Prof? Uh, contributing around about 4% to uh, global pollutants, yet most of the issues with climate change are happening in Africa. That's part one. Part two of this, of course, is we know how low the standards of health care uh, for pregnant women in our continent can actually be. You know, you're very correct, and I think people don't know, aren't fully aware of this, that, that Africa is going to be in already, it is in some ways, the worst affected continent. We're also the least least able to adapt. So to adapt, you need a, quite a, a whole range of, of, of things that make you a resilient setting. One of them is healthcare, as, as you mentioned. We're also least responsible for emissions, which you note mm. very carefully. But perhaps what's becoming quite aware, but also was obvious, I guess, is that we're not able to to argue for climate finance, or you might consider reparations, since we haven't, we haven't, we, have, we, we aren't responsible for those emissions yet. We bear the, the burden of, of dealing with them. Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, if I understand correctly, the healthcare sector not involved in this climate change forum that the president's, uh, the climate change commission, if I remember correctly, uh, is looking at at the moment. So uh, you having to deal with the problems, yet you aren't part of the conversation. You aren't at the table. You know, the, the, one of the saddest things about climate change is we've, we've left it to the energy sector to, to, to resolve and to, and to governments. And the amount of uh, finances that are, that are available for industry to influence a government um, to, 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 you know, to fund some of the election campaign in, in, and in return to, to, to have a more favorable government. And I think you see that throughout the world. It's really difficult for governments to to behave um, or, or to act against um, industry, given the amount of money that is, uh, is available. So you really need a sector like health to, to step in and to play a larger role, because hopefully the health sector has, has ideally our patients at, at heart, you know, as I think, you know, as, as, is, as has been discussed a little bit this morning, that, that we, we, if we were more involved and more directly included in the sector, mm -hmm. and I think in some ways government is scared of the health sector. They, they struggled against us during the COVID epidemic. And the last thing they want is a, is a large group of doctors coming in and, and kind of shaping the energy mix and, and pointing out the, the problems with their actions. Yeah, but I suppose the, the problem could be, Prof, as well, is that, uh, as you suggest, governments may be scared of the health sector shaking things up, but uh, things had to be shaken up very quickly during COVID as well. Is it going to take a crisis uh, to occur and to be uh, deemed a crisis by or the World Health Organization, for example, on this issue before governments take it seriously? You know, this is uh, one of the biggest questions and the biggest problems in, in climate change is where, who's going to drive this, um, mm -hmm. the massive changes that are needed in the world? It, you know, it's probably unlikely to be governments and it's unlikely to be the general population because of the range of daily challenges they face. They, you know, most people can't think five years ahead or think about their grandchildren you know, it, uh, from day to day. So it really needs to be driven from a sector like health and from universities who are able to do what's called a social tipping point, where at a certain point, let's say the Kruger Park burns from north to, to south, 
um, you know, completely burns through. That might be a, a social tipping point. I think mm. you alluded to that, that something needs to happen to shift perceptions. Yeah. It's unlikely that there will be a shift until we do get something, something really, really massive. Prof, I just have my final question to you. Obviously, let's hope it doesn't get to that point. Uh, we don't need a seismic uh, shift to, to make something happen. Uh, let's imagine for a moment that all the people that you want to have listen uh, to this, to make a difference, are listening right now. Prof, as I say goodbye to you, what are you telling them this morning? I'm telling you that maybe one of the key messages is, is we have the wrong term. It actually should be called climate change. I mean, sorry, climate choice, not, not change. But that's a, that's a passive word. We, at the moment, are choosing the climate. Um, in the next 10 years or so, we have a period where we can choose the climate for the, for the, future, for the, 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 the future of the world. Um, and that's, a, that's, the, that's my key message, is during this brief period when we can choose what the climate will be, let's, <laughs> let's try and make some wise choices. Mm. Because after that period, they will get a whole series of cascades, and, and they, there will be no no more choices available to us. The, the world will take over, and the natural world will then uh, be the ones making the choices. Yeah, so please, can we start to behave a bit sensibly? Yeah? yeah, the choice is still within the timeline for us to make a difference. Unfortunately, though, it is running out. Professor, I thank you for your time uh, this morning. Wits University Professor Matthew Chersich. I'm sure you can go and find either uh, the, his scholarly work online. Uh, you can look for climate change scholar and epidemiologist uh, Professor Matthew Chersich.